so many people here today for this uh, talk about the exhibition downstairs by Yuken Teria. This is Yuken. Um, Hello. Thanks. Um, the Okinawan uh, artist. Um, and uh, this evening he's going to be in conversation with Jonathan Watkins, uh, the director of Icon Gallery in Birmingham. Um, and I'll just briefly introduce the two of them. And actually before I do, I'd also like to mention a couple of uh, uh, people and organizations that have helped us. So Kanasa has been uh, supporting this exhibition. There was talk they were going to provide some special Okinawan cocktails today, but I'm afraid oh, <laughs> oh, apparently they're going to be provided tomorrow. So, um, you know, a bit of inside information there. Um, and we'd also like to thank the collector, Philippe Le Vieux, who has lent us one of the pieces, the uh, very beautiful piece of the uh, money um, sort of growing. Uh, downstairs, so thank you, Philippe. Right, um, so I'll just briefly introduce uh, our two speakers. So, Yuken Teria was born in Okinawa in 1973. Um, his BFA in oil painting was from Tama Art, uh, Tama Art University in Tokyo, and then he moved to New York where he did his MFA. Um, he's been exhibited widely all over the world, really, um, and his works are included in. Uh, quite a large number of important collections, including MoMA in New York, the Guggenheim, um, Smithsonian, the Charles Saatchi Collection, uh, the 21st Century Museum of Contemporary Art in Kanazawa, the Mori Museum, and so on. So he's uh, one of Japan's most internationally recognized artists, certainly one of Okinawa's most um, mm -hmm. internationally recognized artists. And then Jonathan um, has been the director of Icon Gallery uh, in the center of Birmingham for over 20 years. Um, and I think it's fair to say, as, as somebody who specialises in Japan, I can say that Jonathan is probably the leading expert on uh, contemporary Japanese art in this country. Um, but of course, his expertise is a lot broader than that. Um, he, as well as running the gallery in Birmingham for many years, he has curated all sorts of um, big exhibitions around the world. Um, Sydney, Shanghai, Sharjah, uh, Beijing, Milan, um, you name it, uh, he's been there. So, um, on that note, I think I'll leave the two of you to have a conversation together. Okay. Um, well, you can, the first question I'd like to ask you is, how did you decide on the combination of works for this exhibition? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I thought this show is a great opportunity to, sh to show a uh, uh, series of my kimono uh, works, <coughs> which is um, made by a Kinawan traditional uh, dye and kimono tailor technique. It's called Bingata, Bingata te Kimono. That's also, this kimono, it's shows tradition, not only just traditional method, method of making pattern or uh, color of kimono. But to me, conceptually, those works as a series show deeper, uh, uh, deeper message. It's not just a, <clears throat> just a style, but it, to me, it's a trans, tran, uh, transformation or a, a translation process from aesthetically, from from uh, from the past when Okinawa was a kingdom, it was called Ryukyu Kingdom, and the style contain and con has a condensed of aesthetic from the past, and I choose issue from present time or pick elements from the, re uh, the time we read. It. So when it becomes stylized, when part of tradition, traditional pattern, to me, it's a, the voicing from the past with aesthetically and, and examining what's happening to our time. 
So it's my digital translation system. So it's very important to do that piece. Mm. I mean, there's an early, uh, the earliest one that we see was made mm. in New York, and you have the, I mean, the kimono um, as a sort of uh, format for decoration is really interesting, and and you combine traditional. Um, uh, configurations with motifs like um, parachuting soldiers and, and aeroplanes. Mm -hmm. and so there's a reference, very strong reference to American um, presence in, in Okinawa. Yes, exactly. Um, the kimono that you mentioned uh, is called, must be called U, U, UI UI, which is on display in, in um, one of the room. Uh, and it's also my first uh, kimono design uh, made for this series. And yes, there's um, Shidare Zakura, the, 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 the cherry blossom tree, uh, so falling from the shoulder. And I, I replaced some of the flowers to uh, explosion of the bomb, the parachuters, and you see the fighter jets uh, along the shoulder pattern. Um, but I, th I was I was thinking um, how I think it was investigation of where we stand. Uh, we see we we are facing this issue of um, U.S. military base bases in Okinawa, and felt this issue got stuck always and politically. And maybe there's a way to to talk, or there's another way to communicate. There's communi other communication available to 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 find solutions or to get to get over this this uh, solution. And I was invited to uh, a show in Tokyo, so I I used this I put that like, show as an opportunity as I as I create a new platform to bring this issue to a different place from Okinawa. Well, it's, it's actually exa what's exactly the uh, same thing happening here. I'm bringing, I, I'm, I was invited to the, show, to the show here. It's a great opportunity for me to bring an issue in Okinawa through my, through, through the exhibition. So I took the same, same way, uh, same method. It's interesting that that work was made in, in New York that, as Jason said, you were, <coughs> went to art school first in Tokyo. And mm -hmm. of course, the, the, um, the political difficulty between uh, Okinawa and Tokyo is, you know, I mean, you feel it keenly. In fact, I know that you've made work about that. Right. You know, for example, the work with the newspapers called Capital, mm -hmm. where uh, you show all, the new, all these rural, regional newspapers, right. and, and none from, uh, None from Tokyo, right. with an idea that you you're trying to to um, uh, convey the fact that there are many other points of view, mm -hmm. uh, not just the metropolitan one. But then you go to America, and and uh, and of course you know America has had a huge impact on Okinawa, and it's and it would be interesting to know what it was like for you when you when you first arrived, and and the fact that it was ironically in America that you started to think of yourself more as Okinawa? Well, my, my, my motivations were very simple at the time. And as <clears throat> I had her time uh, showing, uh, showing the work about Okinawa uh, within the frame of uh, um, Japanese art community or uh, in general in Japan. So I thought I'd better go to the US and in an environment where the contemporary arts uh, in the US that has more uh, actively talking, uh, involving with uh, uh, politics. So I, 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 need, a, I need a more uh, influence from the US. Um, the, and the contemporary art in the US. That was, a, that was the number one uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. then, um, and then you've made a number of <coughs> works that deal with uh, 
sort of colonial politics, colonialist politics, and imperialism. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we're going from Japan to um, uh, to the States, and there are also works in this exhibition that refer to British uh, national ad identity. And of course, you know, we are only too aware of the fact that we are. Um, well, you know, we have been a little bit fixated on our identity as as an imperial fading fast. Um, can you talk about about colonialism and the impact it has in terms of cultural uh, cultural heritage? Because I think that I mean that's I mean mm -hmm. it's I mean particularly in places like Okinawa, where you know it was in the seventeenth century, it was you know Ryukyu culture was annexed and then. 19th century, it became a, a prefecture of, uh, of Japan. This place is so far away and feels so distant, and then all of a sudden, it's, it's being um, it's being claimed by you know a political centralized government far, far away. Uh, can you can, because I know that you're very interested in um, uh, sort of cultural value. Vis-a-vis vis -vis with respect to colonial power and politics. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think as I explained earlier, um, 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 cultural uh, heritage like bingata, uh, kimono, uh, bingata style, to me is a hope to hope. Right. It's a tool and hope to to see our issues and colonial powers from from different way or through 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 uh, visuals and instead of exchanging exchanging communication through text or language, there's a visual element and and visual elements. May have different out different input to the to the audience, and it, it has a wider connection to to uh, uh, to uh, our sensitivity. Like um, like music, for example, or food uh, has has a historical background that we don't need to rely on language, but you can feel it. You can you can sense it. To the style of the uh, style of the pattern, color. Um, there's a portrait of Elizabeth and the room, but it's it was but it was come up through uh, aesthetic view of Bingata. It's it's uh, you, it's it's it was um, <clears throat> it's a voice from of Bingata. It's I don't. Uh, it's really, it's not my decision to make Bingata style Elizabeth. It's all fully controlled by traditional decisions. Well, this mostly from craftsmen, craftsmen that I, whom I work for for more than twenty years. So it, 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 vision and processes will be detached from the political conversations that we, we usually do. It has its own way of communication. That's I find it hope, and I believe there's a potential to find other solutions. Does it make sense? To yes, it does. An but it, and I think the um, uh, you know it's, count, it's to some extent count, a counteraction. I mean, Bingata as a as a, a way of printing, as I understand it, was more or less um, finished around the time of American occupation in the in the 1940s. And then, um, and then, of course, there's a the whole question of language, and this refers to the video that's downstairs. There's an American uh, Okinawan performer mm -hmm. who is singing in uh, Ryukyu, mm -hmm. and and it's almost uh, like a sort of retrieval of something that was lost. You know, that language was suppressed by central government central. in mm -hmm. Japan, in the same way that Bingata as a as a technique was lost and. Mind is, I think, but correct me if I'm wrong, that to some extent you're concerned with the retrieval of something, almost like kind of trying to pull something back that, that could be lost. A cultural heritage. 
Um, to me, it's already there. I don't feel it's lost. Me, no. well, technique okay. once it's lost, mm. and with lots, like lots of that effort of, by the craftsmen, um, right after World War Two, they, with their efforts, that the the technique was re uh, rebirth and and I'm. I'm I'm take I'm taking all this um, um, sort of taking grant, granted from the efforts in the, in the, from the past. Um, but anyway, total, but it's an interesting point of view, and mm. think about that. Yeah, I'm particularly <clears throat> sensitive to it because we've been working with a, an artist from Hokkaido who's Ain Ainu at Icon recently, and. I mean, there's the, 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 the sadness, profound sadness of the fact that she can't speak the language that she feels is her native tongue. And uh, a very similar story of, of the um, suppression of not only language, mm -hmm. but also traditional rituals and, um, and, art, and art forms. Or, you know, for example, this tattooing uh, that uh -huh. was traditional, right. um, you know, for uh, Ainu women was then, was then made illegal and they no longer have access to the hunting grounds that they used to have and this this uh, this kind of thing. And so much of what she deals with is, or so much of her work seems to be <coughs> sort of, a, you know, an attempt to sort of bring back something back into her life that she felt uh, she, that had mm -hmm. been lost, but, and for political re reasons. There's, um, there's the other, the other thing too which interests me uh, is of course that with, um, with the, because you know, with the um, uh, annexation of um, the annexation of Okinawa coincided with the arrival of, of Europeans uh, in the mid nineteenth century, and you're dealing with sort of cultural activity that would normally be or conventionally be considered to be craft. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, binigata, for example, but you're you're now, um, it's, it's sort of through your activity, it's sort of co-opted into, um, into a, a, world of fine, a world of fine art, which is a, essentially a Western, uh, you know, we brought an, an idea of bijutsu with us. And it would be um, interesting to know how you, do you distinguish between art and craft, or are you, to some extent through your practice, trying to um, uh, blur the line between the two. Um, recently, I stopped thinking about it. <laughs> I used to think a lot because um, I questioned myself whether I more li more into crafts. Like as well, I guess if I talk if I uh, talk about my experience uh, of processing uh, of the process of making of of being that with being that a series, mm. <clears throat> certainly I have to. To, to to make my to make my concept works, the kimono should stay within the definition of bingata. You know, to keep their voice um, active in, in our uh, in our present time, I have to stick. I have to understand aesthetically, aesthetical point of view, point of view and method and methods also. But I'm bringing taking this elements to contemporary art exhibitions or, or, or theater plays and I'm taking this uh, content from craftsmanship to something somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's my focal, that's my, that makes me excited and that's what I feel like this is what my rule as, as, an, as an artist or mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, same way, <clears throat> kind of going back to the topic we, we talked five minutes ago. If I take this old uh, there's a, the elements from the past, the traditional uh, that has been passed from the I mean uh, inherited from the past. I'm more interested in taking this not to think about the past, but how to bring it to the future. How to reinvent this uh, this elements and and reactivate to 
to fit our to to fit our reality of where we in where we live and I'm hoping to bring this reinvented element making continue work and continue reactivated mm -hmm. in the future. That's mm -hmm. I think that's my, my recent interest. There is um, mm -hmm. your interest in, in museum culture and mm -hmm. you know to some extent it's expressed here with the mm -hmm. monopoly uh, mm -hmm. I, call them, I call them collages or assemblages, you know, where you have um, an image of the British Museum, the plan of the British Museum, the plan of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Again, the kind of institutions that, well, I mean, they're, they epitomize a culture that, that, um, that was brought to Japan and Okinawa from outside. Um, you know, with the notion of with the notion of fine art, and you're interested in them as institutions within a world of um, well, in fact, they are they are uh, next to a work which is all about luxury and uh, and high value. And I wondered how how you saw your participation in an art market with an idea of art that comes, you know, ultimately from from the outside. Um, which is essentially a which is essentially a luxury market, um, and that you're and that you're dealing with that, mm -hmm. you and critical and uh, as and also critical of that. How um, you know how do you? But it's also a bit like being in America and critical of America, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, I th <coughs> yeah, um, yeah. Dealing with art market in New York definitely uh, uh, become part of inspiration of my work or my practices. And um, we are, I guess we are talking, I think that we are talking about monopoly money cuts out collage pieces. Just around oh, the corner. This is another example mm -hmm. of luxury and art. Yes, exactly. This exactly. is, a, and also New York. <laughs> it's a Tiffany uh, shopping bag. It's a shopping bag from Tiffany, uh, uh, the you know the jewelry company and so uh, I take empty Tiffany bags and cut it at the shape of tree and bring the light back. I mean uh, the tree that represent uh, represent paper that used to be a tree or, or um, plant and so I'm interested in mostly take using existing value but it's empty bag it's maybe it's it's valueless elements but i'm adding different value in, in the material so i playing with this i click i take the value uh, idea of value and materiality and kind of mix sometimes mix it and sometimes flip one like one to the others so this is the the piece um uh, Johnson just mentioned, uh, it's, which is displayed, it's called Dawn, uh, and it's displayed next to Monopoly uh, collage pieces. Um, I took um, luxury brand, I, I high heel sandal from luxury brand, and I add, um, let me see, must be another picture, oops, um, and I put, I take, I I put living crystals attached and attached to underneath of high heel sandals and they hatched from sandal. So what happened conceptually, the sandal lose, um, it, it, taking the, the function, original function of sandal, the high heel sandals to be made, now it's turning to be a usage for instinct, uh, instinct or butterfly. To, to, to be hatched. Um, and also question of how, what, how we define beauty from luxury brand or like luxury product. Um, and if we find luxury aesthetically, maybe there's a connection to the nature uh, where, where common, there's, there's common ground between the, us as a human and other other animals or other insects can share with. And um, 
this is, um, I apply the same idea uh, this time for a st steering wheel from my service bench. And yeah, and this, is the, the, this is the chrysalis at the top, I think. Right. Yeah. The picture on the left is related to this work, um, to the steering wheel. Uh, this is also like a part of the buttons that like, uh, you see from the cars, and I also in added a butterfly-shaped buttons and so try to raise questions what I mean this this part is from luxury car and um, what does if if we have buttons in a luxury car what does what do buttons mean and and I was trying to push uh, the different push the idea of luxury whether it's and expand trying to expand the idea of luxury to sort of sustainable or environmental uh, the thinking level, not instead of just focusing fine, instead of focusing fine leather or fine materials, but actively dealing with the function of the product they are, they are, they are designing or they are putting as, as, a, as a brand. So that was sort of the, the I, not, that was the so sort of next uh, idea that I was trying to push through this uh, series. Of mm -hmm. But now tell me about how how life changed for you in New York. I mean, you're not Yukon is now living in uh, Berlin, and it would be interesting to. But it's almost like you maybe you arrived as a a chrysalis and then and then came, <laughs> became came a butterfly and then you flew to Berlin. I mean, could, but how, how was it the um, your I mean you, you arrived as a student and then you made your way in the art market with the with the kind of difficulty, almost cognitive yes. dissonance that, that we've been referring to, because you're critical of that world or yes, certainly critical of of that world of of luxury as it um, and we talked about not just value but capitalism earlier, and um, you know but you're having to participate. You're having to participate in that system. Yes, well, I'm, I believe there are artists in this group, so um, you guys might have some like, similar experience that I have, but I'm participating in. Um, be, be, becoming a full-time artist um, to me was meaning to me was dealing with the art market and um, and that was not easy. that's 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 not easy and but what I discovered what I how I understood as in terms of how I position in the art, art market is to to propose a, a, re, a propose a new body to the market, and hopefully galleries will agree to to promote this new body, maybe with the, the sprouts over newspaper or a tree. A, made out of McDonald's, that shopping bag. So for me, it's proposing new value, and I need a, par I need a, I need a, a partner to, to, to present this value to the market. So it's, and hopefully the market will, will acknowledge that mm -hmm. and, and add in, and add another level of, another um, element of the, so that it started going going to the market. And that, then, was, that was my sort of battleground that I was. Yeah. I, I, I'm still in. <laughs> yeah, no, that I, I I'm so aware of it as a as something that many many artists are, are dealing with. The interesting thing is that you left New York and went mm -hmm. to and went to Berlin, uh, and I wondered what prompted prompted you to do that. Um, I mean, what, why what did way? you why why did you leave New York and go to Berlin? <clears throat> I felt um, uh, 
I feel I need to reinvent myself. Mm -hmm. And I've seen New York for 20 years, and I, I thought I should, I should, uh, I should be in different environment and maybe change myself in a different, different scale or more explore different uh, activities, method, and after, um, and also uh, uh, my partner and um, the artists I always respect and who influenced me a lot in the Hartenstein has mm -hmm. helped me to, and he, she encouraged me to, to go to, to Berlin. Um, but, uh, but I did change, I believe it did, it did change my, my style. Yes, I was going and, to say, uh, how, how? Well, you see, uh, well, I made, well, I was taking um, those luxury brands or luxury shopping culture uh, as a part of my elements or like living uh, everyday materials a lot when I was in the U.S. After I moved to Berlin, I started seeing more people uh, closely, um, so I, I uh, and you know, being in Europe um, helped me to, to to access to different, different back, people from different backgrounds and from different uh, 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 professions. And so after the move, moving to Berlin, I with also with the help from Linda, who is also who is a media artist and. Uh, uh, no, no, multi-disciplinary artist, and um, uh, we, I started exploring more video works, mm -hmm. where involving more people, not only me, but group of people. That's where you see the the Lemaire, the video piece that is, which has also become a postcard, uh, is made, and also in the downstairs you see a car flipping. Uh, game that I, I create, we invented in Okinawa, which is also involving more people. So I more, the, I began to start making works that's involving more, more, more people. Uh, so from move, moving from everyday object to more dealing with more people and the culture behind other people that become part of my, my medium. Mm -hmm. yeah, so the work is, is noticeably more re relational, as we say, uh, you know, in, in that it's more participatory. There's the, the work with the La Mer, with the fish. There is the, um, there's the, the, your father's grand game where people are in, involved in tipping cars over, with reference to uh, protests from the 70s where American cars were vandalized mm -hmm. in this, right, in yeah. this way. Yeah, yeah. It's presumably... Did your, did your father participate in this, uh, right? I actually my father didn't, but his, his generation. Yeah, okay, okay. A big part of that event. There's one, uh, one more question, and then the, the conversation uh, uh, becomes uh, everyone's. Um, and we finished around seven o'clock. But there was, I was asked before this, um, uh, before this talk if I had some questions that I could, that I could give to you, kind of, you know, to, you know, just so he knew kind of where I was coming from. And it's always been um, sort of interesting to me, uh, you know, the artist whose work is uh, so loaded, you know, so um, um, uh, with such political content. And in the, you know, I read, for example, here uh, in the introduction to the exhibition, you know, that for you, the modest practice of drawing is a mighty tool not only to observe, uh, to observe hierarchies, but to rebalance them. I mean, the idea that art could be an agent of political change, and you know, it's, and it's a very, and every gesture you make is very loaded, and is um, uh, arising out of research and you know, a strong uh, polit political philosophical position. And my question uh, to to you, Ken, and I didn't know that he would take it seriously, and I, but he did. And the question was, do you ever fantasize about being an abstract painter, and, <laughs> and, and I, ne I, I nearly didn't ask you, but you've encouraged me to ask it now. So that's my fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> to to 
to explore my uh, abstractions. Well, um, <clears throat> it's been more than 20 years. Uh, I feel like I've been feel, feel like I'm becoming a mirror of the, mirroring uh, of, of, like what's happening outside me, outside of me, or how I think of history of Okinawa and struggle in life in, but nowadays where uh, somehow I take take the elements from our environment and digest and bring back. That's that was I believe that was my style. But then recently as a fantasy i I began to think, what if I have just just me myself? What what would be is that am I able to bring something just from myself? That that become my my question uh, as well. Um, I think there are two uh, four watercolor paintings in the exhibitions that also help me to to more, more dealing with what what I can draw from from just from myself. So that's those are good exercise for me to. Well, they are still figurative uh, expressions, but dealing with fluid, fluid water, watercolors really give me a sense of sort of heading to more freedom in expression and dealing with material materiality. So to me, it's a kind of a um, noble step to to heading towards the abstraction. I think. Very well. You heard it here.